That idea of sanctuary, I know, has many different meanings today. I like to think of a sanctuary as a place in which everyone is welcome, obviously, but also a place of safety, um, a place in which you can feel comfortable. In The Hunchback of Notre Dame, even in the Disney version, uh, you have people saying, you know, sanctuary, please give us sanctuary, and you know, banging on the doors of the church. And that's a in a sense because that's our theology, that God is our refuge and our safety, and that's where we hope to live our lives. But also because of that, the followers of God in Jesus Christ are meant to offer that sort of sanctuary to others, to their neighbors, to fellow human beings. In this story, the future and the present come together. There has been a strong history going all the way back to the medieval period in cathedrals of offering refugees and others, uh, those who are perhaps fleeing from the law, uh, a safe place to hide. It's not actually a law, it's just a tradition, but that if people found their way to a church, uh, that law enforcement would not come into that sacred space to remove them. It's true of both English law and European law in general during the medieval period that sanctuary was legal. It was a fairly complex legal ritual. The fugitive could stay in sanctuary for 40 days, and then he would confess his crime to the king's representative, give up all his goods to the crown, and go into exile. What does that have to do with modern day sanctuary? Well, I think that one of the ways that sanctuary works now is as a commentary on the law. It is not simply something that is outside or beyond the law. It is not simple law breaking, but rather a form of nonviolent protest. The idea of sanctuary goes way back. Um, in the West, we're most familiar of its start in the Hebrew Bible. The Book of Numbers, which is in the Torah of Jews, as well as the Old Testament of Christians, and acknowledged by Muslims as well, the Book of Numbers has a passage in which Moses is enjoined by God to make six cities of the Promised Land into sanctuary cities. And these are places where um, Jews and others who are in need of some kind of haven, safe haven, can go. Judaism going back to the time of Abraham and Sarah, um, when Abraham saw three, well, it turned out to be three angels, but three men approaching him in the desert. And he immediately jumped up and said, please, come into my tent. Um, Judaism has always uh, emphasized the sense of hospitality and welcoming. We say, Baruchim Habaim, come and be blessed. One of the common religious orientations that is often lost in today's society that the religious communities are really good at preserving more broadly than the sanctuary movement is hospitality. That there's this idea of the welcome of the stranger. Masjid is not only for Muslims. If anyone wants to come, they are most welcome. It is told and taught in any masjid that you would go to that anyone who comes to your house and he's your guest for three days you, you must provide him, him or her, whoever that person is. And the welcome of someone who's traveling and in need and just wants to, you know, have a place to rest and recuperate for a while. And, um, and you know, the idea that you don't do that just for your own community, that you do that specifically for someone who's not from your community, who's a stranger, who's um, come from afar. It doesn't matter the nomination, no matter who you are. Mm -mm. We let you in. We welcome you. That's, that's our, our open door policy, come as you are. It doesn't matter the nationality, the creed, or color. We don't, we don't care. Just come as you are. A sanctuary is a place of safety. 
a, a place that you can, like the Bible said in the uh, 91st Psalm, you can come into the house of God, you can worship, you can pray, you can uh, let go of some of the things you have going on in your life. Sometimes people need to ask God to forgive them, forgive people that has trespassed against them. Applying sanctuary to other religions um, gets into kind of plastering a Christian and originally Jewish word onto what they're doing. So I don't think that every house of worship has what you would call a sanctuary. The concept is very adaptable. Lots of different houses of worship are thinking about sanctuary, um, but it may not have, you know, exact parallel. Today's day and age, there's, uh, you know, with the police and the law and stuff like that, there's no real physical sanctuary in the sense that you're not going to be safe from harm in a temple. Um, but it, it, for us, it's a mental sanctuary in the sense that this is a place where we come to calm the mind. They know this is a safe environment for their family. It's a safe environment for themselves. Okay. Has anyone ever, like your mom tells you to do something, but she never does it herself? Yeah. yeah. In the joy of others lies our own, in the good of others lies our own and in the progress of others lies our own. And you give up that ego that's from within, where you're chasing your own happiness and instead becoming more selfless. So that's the, that's the philosophy that we imbibe. And that's why this temple in that sense is a, yeah, it's a mental sanctuary in that sense. The angle to sanctuary that I think that resonates in our particular tradition is the idea that People need places where they can be themselves, be who they are, and not be at risk. Uh, a lot of the, the current national attention is around immigration, but I also think about historically in our denomination, we've been a sanctuary for LGBT folk. And I, I'm not sure that folks would always make the conscious alignment between sanctuary and that, but I think about particularly the teens who are LGBT in our, in our faith, they, not always, they don't always have a place that's warm and welcoming outside. And, they know that this space, at our best, is a sanctuary. Houses of worship and community members wanting to know what they can do and how they can help. And it does build on the 1980s sanctuary movement in the United States, which was largely about housing immigrants, um, refugees from the Central American Wars. The problems in Central America and then the, the dictatorships and U.S. policy and catechists were being killed and you know, people being disappeared. You know, I opened up a house with a group of people here in Wyandanch, we bought an old boarded up house and we fixed it to provide a space for, uh, for undocumented people. So we declared sanctuary and we joined the sanctuary movement, which was very active in, in Arizona and Texas and uh, Georgia. The concept of the sanctuary, uh, a space, a safe space within a dangerous zone of some kind and even you know ice and, and the you know, you know immigration will you know they will not go into a church like how far can you push that that's the that's our point now it's it's got to become more nuanced you know an, an undocumented person any court appearance even a traffic court is a potential scenario for arrest. Okay, so it's an accompaniment movement. So, so it's a being a being present too. So to be with people, not, that that you can document. It's it's somewhat it's extending, you know, expanding the concept of sanctuary. The sanctuary nowadays has become such a kind of charged term. It's quite different in a lot of ways from the framework. For one thing, today, sanctuary is, you know, it's sort of the reverse. It's trying to prevent exile for immigrants. 
trying to protect people's lives, daily lives, family lives, work lives. And what that means is always under question. So there's no accident that today we have these arguments about sanctuary and about whether it's okay for immigrants to be protected within sanctuaries and whether law enforcement can cross those boundaries, and if so, where and when and how.